Hello everyone, we can, we can start the last session of, uh, of Tuesday and we would like to concentrate today on the artificial intelligence as the toolkit which we can use also for consumer protection. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to the online moderator, uh, Martina, the floor is yours. Martina, are you with us? Because we cannot hear you. Maybe you are muted. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, look, we can hear you. Perfect. Can you see me? Not yet. Not yet. OK, so let me let me give it a try. Before um, before I will start, it would make a little bit sense that you can see me as well. So let me see. Otherwise, please, the technical assistance, if you could try and uh, help me with this, that would be wonderful. Um, either way, I will not take more time with my uh, technical issues. Uh, welcome, everybody. And it's really, it's really great to be uh, for the third time at the Internet Governance Forum. So we are really happy that um, it, also this year we can uh, alert um, the, the forum to um, consumer protection issues and that this year as well we have a wonderful um, panelist with us. So welcome everybody and thanks for giving us this opportunity. Um, I will start saying one of the um, biggest truisms that you have heard in the last times uh, and also uh, one of the most hard things these days which is that AI has been changing our lives. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that you guys are all tired hearing this, but even though we've heard it so many times, it doesn't make it any less um, any less important. Um, uh, so we need to discuss and we need to converge about around this issue, and uh, um, this is why we have organized this panel. Um, and now the question is, why is it important to discuss AI in the context of consumer protection? Um, for us, uh, consumer protection authorities and, and many panelists who um, also have to do with uh, consumer protection, um, the issue basically is that um, firms and entrepreneurs have economical technological advantage over consumers, which means that they can use AI to, um, to take um, uh, to, to, to have greater possibilities of um, doing unfair practices against uh, consumers. Uh, this is one option. Of course, AI can also be used for good purposes. And our um, task as um, consumer protection enforcers and all stakeholder, stakeholders that are, um, that are active in the area of consumer protection, our task is to understand to what extent we should curb AI use by companies and to what extent we should try and um, um, and try and allow it to uh, and flourish um, to actually assist consumers, for example, by um, having a better choice of products. Uh, so this is a big challenge for us, uh, consumer protection um, stakeholders, and uh, we are we need discussions, we need to speak, we need to um, we need to have um, we need to engage with this topic. This is why we we think that it's very important to to. Um, to continue discussing it, even though we, we are already discussing it a lot. Um, and um, as an emerging topic, we really need to have a wider conversation about it. And IGF is a great forum for that. Uh, we have all internet stakeholders around here. 
um, people who are concerned not only with consumer protection as we are, but also with other things, who are much more knowledgeable about uh, different technologies and uh, and how 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 they are being used uh, online. So it's great, and we hope that uh, we'll have a wider discussion here. And and I hope, and I'm pretty sure Piotr will also be able to follow up with uh, on this with many uh, of the participants uh, that are uh, fortunate enough to be there in person. Um, and the one final thing uh, of introduction is, um, except for trying to understand the impact of consumer uh, on consumers and the scope of intervention by authorities uh, in the context of AI in consumer protection, there is one more thing that we have been exploring as um, consumer protection agency, which is the use of AI to our own purposes in um, investigating um, unfair practices. So while we can see and monitor the use of AI by companies, it is also a great tool for us to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our own actions and our own activities. So we are also doing this. We are um, um, conducting two projects where we develop AI tools and we are also um, aware that there is many other such projects all over the globe. Um, our colleagues, uh, will, our panelists will, will uh, tell you more about that. Um, so Piotr, uh, that would be all from my side and uh, I wish you all a great panel. I I'm pretty sure you will be able now to, to present the, the panelists. Thanks very much. Thank you, Martina. Uh, I, I totally agree that we have to, uh, we have to discuss the, the problem of using AI. Uh, I have to also admit that uh, last week we had a panel among the other consumer protection agencies on ISPAN conference when we are gathering together with the institutions which have the same aim, namely uh, protection of consumers uh, in each jurisdiction. And uh, then we, we, con we focus on what we have in our, in our uh, pockets, in our desks, what kind of tools we are using. And we, we concentrated more on the risks uh, which are uh, connecting to using of AI. And today, I think that the panel on the Internet Governance Forum, as Martina mentioned, it's, we are the third time already in this uh, summit, is the better place to discuss the, the, the possibilities, the future, how we can de develop further. Uh, I, I strongly believe that the artificial intelligence will be used by many agencies uh, uh, it's already actually in usage, it's already in operation by many agencies, uh, but it will be developing pretty fast and definitely it is needed to, for the detection of the traditional uh, violations, but also for the infringements which are uh, new, which are connected to the, um, uh, to the new world of the digital services. Um, so today, for, for, for the, the, that reason, to that aim, we invited our uh, prominent guests, uh, uh, Professor Christine Rifa from University of Reading, uh, who made a far off uh, survey on usage of AI by the, by the consumer protection agencies, uh, representatives of uh, um, international organizations, uh, which is OECD, uh, which deal with the shaping of the consumer policy worldwide uh, with uh, Melanie McNeil on board with us and uh, the representative of the DG Just, Angelo Grieco, and other people from the enforcement authorities from ACCC, Sally Foskett, and myself as well. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Kevin from Tony Blair Institute for Global Change uh, to talk with us from the perspective of uh, uh, consul cons cons consultancy world. Uh, so the structure of the panel would look like uh, two runs. Uh, so first we will present uh, the tools we are already have. And then in the second round, we will ask our guests about the future, about the possible developments. So first, I would like to turn to Christine uh, and uh, ask her about the outcomes of her, serv of her survey. Christine, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. I'm trying to quickly share my slides to help with following up what I'm trying to describe. Um, I think you should all see them now. So thank you very much for having me and it's a pleasure to join you only virtually, um, but still had this very um, amazing conference. Um, I will give you a tiny little bit of background before because I'm 
um, aware that perhaps some people joining this panel are not consumer law specialists. So consumer protection really is, is a world uh, with, with, with several ways of ensuring that the rights of consumers are actually uh, respected and enforced. Uh, it's a fairly fast developing area of law, but it has a very unequal spread and level of maturity across the world, and that does cause some problem in the enforcement of consumer rights. We also rely um, in most countries of the world that have consumer law on the spread of private and public enforcement. And um, AI, um, as the subject of today, can actually assist on both sides um, of the enforcement uh, conundrum. Um, we also have um, a number of consumer associations and other representative organizations that can assist um, consumers with um, their rights, but as well can assist public enforcement and agencies in the UK. A, a very um, good example is that which the Consumer Association is actually able to ask the regulator and the enforcers to take some action. So um, that's um, variable across the world what they can do, but they normally are a very important element of the equation as well. We've seen in previous years, um, pretty much around the world, a shrinking of court access for consumers as well, um, and an increase in ADR and ODR, as well as uh, realization, I think, that public enforcement through agencies um, is really um, an important aspect of the mix on how to protect consumers. Hence, the session today is obviously extremely important to ensuring we can further the rights of consumers um, and develop our markets uh, in a healthy way. So the uh, project I've been involved with uh, is called EMFTEC, stands for Enforcement Technology. And it really looked at the tools for the here and now that enforcement agencies were using in their daily work. Um, and it also reflected a little bit about the future. I'll keep those comments for the second round. Um, what we found um, is that EnfTech, which is actually a broader um, use of technology than just AI, so it would include anything that um, is perhaps a lower tech, if you wish, than, than uh, artificial intelligence might be, but can be just as effective. And we wanted to look at uh, ways agencies could ensure markets worked optimally and also realize that not using technology in the enforcement mix might lead to a potential obsolescence of consumer protection agencies. And there was therefore an essential need to respond to technological changes. We surveyed about 40 different practices that we came across further, um, not simply in consumer protection, but in more supervisory agencies as well. And we ended up selecting 23 examples of EnfTech that are specific to consumer protection, um, spanning a range of authorities, 14, seven of them were general consumer protection agencies um, spanning five continents and four generation of technologies. It is only a snapshot. Um, it's uh, obviously extremely difficult at this stage to work on public information about use of technology in um, agencies. There's also an element of development and, and, and there are um, also reasons why agencies may not want to very publicly announce that they're using particular tools. So um, the survey, however, has got some really interesting findings. Um, we, in, in the uh, report, um, explain how um, the technological approach will be essential and how to start rolling one out. We give a picture of how agencies that are doing it, are doing it and have they structured themselves in order to enable themselves to rely, to roll out um, EnfTech tools. We also mapped out the generations of technologies because actually um, not all agencies will start from the same starting point. Um, some agencies might be very new, have absolutely no, no data to feed into AI. 
Um, others might be more established, but not have structured data um, in the way that might be useful. Um, we also found that uh, with very little technology, you can actually do a lot in consumer enforcement and therefore our um, report recognizes. this. We provide a list of use cases so for anyone interested in what's happening on the ground, then that's a very good starting point to find out pretty much um, all the examples of things that are currently working. Um, and we also reflected on some practices that we find slightly outside of the remit of consumer protection, but that could be easily rolled into consumer protection. Um, and of course, we discuss challenges. So our key findings, and I think they are quite useful for the purpose of today's discussion, where we're going to hear loads of different examples, is that actually um, AI obviously is a misnomer. We're talking to a very erudite audience here, no need to dwell on this. But um, in consumer protection at the moment, AI is really not the panacea, and we think that um, even in the future, it will not solve all the problems. Um, it has, however, got huge potential. Um, and we found that uh, about 40 to 45% of the consumer authorities we surveyed are using AI tools. Now, that still means that there are 60% of other tools that are still EnfTech tools that are being used and they are not AI. Um, that's quite significant uh, finding because um, just in 2020, at the start of discussions about technology and consumer enforcement, very few in, um, reports or projects actually considered AI as being viable. They were looking at um, other um, technical solutions. What we find as well is that the agencies that have got a dual remit, so that are not just dealing with consumer protection, um, have fared a little bit better um, in their rollout of tools. And that might be because they are able to capitalize on experience um, in competition law, for example, but also because they may have bigger structure and that obviously facilitates uh, a lot of the rollout of uh, technology. If we compare consumer law enforcement to other disciplines, we find that we are behind the curve, but as Piotr mentioned, are uh, catching up very quickly. Um, and the... So I'll move on all of this. Um, and then the final uh, thing to um, for me to point out at this stage before we hear from the example is really that AI as a solution in consumer enforcement needs to be um, built in with a framework and a strategy that will take into account all the potential problems that might come with it. One of the big dangers that we have identified is that um, if there is a lot of staffing, resources, money going into developing AI as a solution for consumer protection enforcement, um, then it would be really a shame to fall at a one big hurdle that will come the way of the enforcement agency. And there is a legal challenge from the companies being investigated. Um, and uh, we found loads of potential issues and things to strategize about, but the um, legal challenges that might come from the use of AI consumer enforcement is one that has been uh, clearly understudied and we didn't find very much on. So that's on that general overview that I leave you and um, pass on the floor to the next panelist. Thank you, Christine. So it's still a lot of work, but it it's looks promising, definitely. Uh, so now I would like to give the floor to Melanie and uh, to, to see how OECD is seeing the opportunity for consumer protection regarding the usage of AI. Hi everyone, um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, if you just bear with me for one moment, I will share my screen very quickly. Sorry for the delay with that. Um, all right, so I'm assuming everyone can see that. 
I'm very excited to be here today um, and the previous presentation very helpful as well in setting this up. Um, so I'm speaking to you today from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development or the OECD, um, where I work in the consumer policy team. Um, so the OECD has 38 member countries and we aim to create better policies for better lives. Um, through a lot of best practice work and working with our members to see what they're doing to address particular issues. So today I'm really excited to talk to you about artificial intelligence and how it can help empower consumers and how it can be of great assistance to consumer law regulators as well. Um, so I'll also be sharing some information with you about the OECD's work in the AI space more generally. Um, so we've just touched on it, but um, first thing I'll talk to you about is uh, using artificial intelligence to detect and deter consumer problems online. Um, as a previous consumer law investigator, this is a topic very close to my heart. Um, we're seeing a lot of AI being used by consumer law regulators as a tool to increase efficiency in finding and addressing uh, potential breaches of consumer law. Um, it's particularly useful invest in investigations um, where work that was previously manual and quite slow, like document review, can now be completed a lot more quickly. Um, there is still and always will be a significant and essential role for investigators, but AI tools can support the preliminary assessments of investigations and highlight conduct that might be a breach of consumer law. Robust investigative principles are always needed uh, with any investigation, and the addition of AI to our toolkits doesn't change that. Um, but I thought it would be helpful to give you some practical examples of some great tools that we've seen our members using. Um, so the Office of the Competition and Consumer Protection in Poland um, uses web crawling technology with AI to analyse consumer contracts looking for unfair contract terms. So the technology searches over the fine print of terms and conditions of things like subscription contracts um, to ensure that there's no unfair clauses, um, such as inability to cancel a contract. Um, so this work previously in most member countries was undertaken manually with groups of investigators reading hundreds of clauses in hundreds of contracts searching for potentially unfair terms. Um, but the AI tool really adds some efficiency to this and regulators can then take enforcement or other action to have the terms removed from the consumer contract, um, preventing consumers from being, from being caught in subscription traps. Um, so that's an example of a tool that really frees up a lot of investigator hours for other things um, and enables investigators to really focus on the key parts of investigations that do need human decision-making and strategic thinking. Um, so another issue faced by consumers online is that of fake reviews. Um, you've probably all seen one at some point. Um, reviews can play a huge part in our purchasing decisions. Um, but to give you an example, last year, Amazon reported 23,000 different social media groups with millions of followers that existed purely to facilitate fake reviews. Um, this is obviously too much for individual consumers to deal with and for regulators, uh, but machine learning models can analyze data points um, and help to detect fraudulent behavior. Um, fake reviews are often classed as a form of misleading or deceptive conduct under consumer law. And while AI, sorry, while regulators are using AI to detect fake reviews, private companies are also investing in this space as well. So this is a, a good example of how businesses and regulators are working together to enable consumers to make better choices. Um, the OECD, we're quite excited about some work that we're hoping to do with, with ISPEN in the near future, um, with member countries looking at the use of artificial intelligence to detect and deter consumer problems online that was referred to earlier. Um, there's some really great efficiencies to be found, which ultimately mean that regulators can detect and deter more instances of consumer issues. So the increased efficiency can deter businesses from engaging in this conduct. Um, and similarly to uh, criminal behavior, if people know they're more likely to be caught, they're less likely to engage in the conduct. Um, so we're very excited about the future work with organizations like ISPEN to share some of this best practice so that other regulators can benefit as well. 
So another space that we're seeing some great work from our members um, is the impact of AI on consumer product safety. Um, so AI is being used to detect and address product safety issues by regulators too. Uh, so for example, Korea's consumer injury surveillance system um, searches for products online that have been the subject of a product safety recall. Um, so where something has been deemed unsafe and withdrawn from, from sale, um, there are cases where nevertheless, um, businesses continue to sell those items. Um, so Korea's consumer injury surveillance system uses AI to search online uh, for text and images to detect cases where those products might still be being sold. Um, using AI in this con context can mean that the unsafe products are found faster, so regulators can take action more quickly and consumer injuries are ultimately reduced. Um, so as well as detecting issues like that, um, Korea is also using AI to assist consumers who might be looking for information or wanting to report an unsafe product. Um, so Korea has an excellent chat bot that they use on their website uh, that consumers can use to report injuries from products. Um, so that if they're harmed by a product, they can report it to the authorities. Uh, the chat bot makes it very simple for them to lodge the information rather than asking them to fill out a, a detailed form. Um, it's more efficient. And then they use coding of the information provided by the consumers um, with machine learning to enable more efficient analysis of the reporting. Um, so when it's easy to report an issue, consumers are more likely to do it. And better data enables regulators to better understand the issues and to address them as well. Um, similarly, AI technology and software in particular with products can enable product safety issues to be diagnosed early. Um, so some of the more advanced home appliances, for example, um, that have software built into them that you might be able to control from your phone, um, they're very useful as well in terms of alerting, product, uh, sorry, alerting consumers to potential product safety issues. They can be notified that a device might need servicing, or report, that repairs are needed, um, or that a remote software update might be required. Um, so there's already been instances with smart devices such as smoke alarms um, that have been remotely repaired um, and a product safety issue addressed through a software update. Um, this type of technology in that circumstance can potentially be life-saving. So the, the increasing prevalence of AI in consumer goods can bring benefits and uh, the gaming industry has always been uh, pretty quick on the uptake with technology. Um, they're investing a lot in AI to change the way that people experience games. But as the use of digital tech intensifies, the way that people communicate and behave online is also changing. Um, so this is an issue where there are new and emerging risks and they're not particularly well understood in all spaces, uh, particularly in the context of mental health. Um, so one of the major projects that we'll be undertaking at the OECD shortly is looking at the impact of consumer health and safety, sorry, the impact on consumer health and safety of digital technologies in consumer products. Um, it'll be focusing on AI connected products and immersive reality and the impact on consumers' health, including mental health. Um, so the project aims to identify uh, current gaps in market surveillance and the way that regulators um, might monitor for product safety issues and to identify future actions to better equip authorities to deal with some of the new risks that are posed by AI and the new technology relating to consumer products. Um, we're aiming to provide practical guidance for industry and regulatory authorities to better understand and address product safety risks. And we're going to have a real focus on consideration of those risks in safety by design. Um, so that's a new project to keep an eye out for. Um, Another space that we have seen AI provide some great benefits in empowering consumers is in the digital and green transition. Um, so many consumers want to make greener choices, but sometimes they don't um, due to information overload or a lack of trust in labeling um, or other behavioral science issues that can affect all of us. So research, research has shown that nudges or design interventions can encourage consumers to make greener choices and can encourage people to behave in a specific direction and overcome some of those behavioral issues that might otherwise prevent them from making a green choice. 
So AI provides an excellent opportunity to nudge consumers towards greener choices. So for example, um, in Germany, like in many countries, um, heating bills are often not prepared in an understandable way um, and they're inconsistent between providers. Each metering service um, can use different formats, different terminology, um, and as a result, consumers find it really difficult to compare uh, which company to choose. They find it really hard to pick up errors in their bills. Um, they end up paying more for energy and services, and incentives to save energy um, are difficult to identify. Um, so this can cost consumers a lot of money, but it also causes a lot of unnecessary emissions because it's so difficult for people to make a greener choice that they essentially give up. I think it's something that we've probably all been guilty of at some point when you look at various contracts for services. So to help consumers manage their energy consumption, the German government has funded a digital tool which uses AI. Um, the household can upload their energy bill um, and it's evaluated using AI to provide a series of facts about how they can reduce their energy consumption and save on heating bills. So the tool is an example of a nudge um, that can help a consumer to make a better energy choice and help them to overcome the barrier of it being too complicated to make that choice. Um, similarly, consumers experience information overload with a lot of the green labels and badges and schemes that you might see on items in the supermarket. Um, and the other issue is that uh, it can be difficult to compare these and consumers have no way to verify um, what's actually happening in a company where they put a green marking on their packaging. Um, so, for example, last year in Australia, they did an online sweep and found that 57% of the claims made in a sample um, were misleading when it came to their green credentials. So there are some parts of the world that's using regulation to really strictly control the way that uh, such markings and accreditation schemes can be used. Um, but where that's not occurring or to substitute that, um, AI can also be used to assist consumers to make the green choice by helping to break through the unmanageable amount of information that's out there. Um, so we're seeing new apps being developed to enable shoppers to scan a barcode of an item at a supermarket and see its sustainability or ethical rating compared to other products. Um, where a product scores poorly, the app can suggest an alternative. Um, these are quite limited at the moment, but we're expecting that in the future, AI will be used to expand the list of products that are considered and to recommend products that align more with users' environmental preferences. Um, so the OECD is currently undertaking our project, um, looking at fostering consumer engagement in the green transition and addressing some of these barriers to sustainable consumption and looking at the opportunities that digital technologies use to promote greener consumption patterns. Um, so this project is also going to involve empirical work to better understand consumer behaviours and attitudes um, towards green consumption. Uh, I'll just take you through as well a couple of the tools that have been developed by the OECD that can be quite relevant. Um, so one of the things that we're working on at the moment is the OECD AI incident monitor. Um, there's been a big increase in reporting of AI risks and incidents in 2023 in particular, the, the rise has just been astronomical. Um, so the OECD AI expert group is looking at this um, and they're using natural language processing to develop the AI incident monitor. Um, so the monitor aims to develop a global and common framework for reporting of AI incidents that could be compatible with current and future regulation. Um, so one of the issues that regulators face in addressing almost any problem um, is consistency of terminology and understanding. Um, so part of this project uh, is looking at developing a global common framework to understand those things. Um, and then the AI incident monitor tracks AI incidents globally and in real time. Um, so it's designed to build an evidence base to inform uh, incident definition and reporting, um, and particularly to assist regulators with developing AI risk assessments, doing foresight work and making regulatory choices. Um, so the, the incident monitor uh, collected uh, hundreds of news articles manually, which was then used to illustrate trends and to help train the automated system. Um, and you can see on the slide there uh, where, the, where the project is up to. Um, they're using natural language processing 
with that model and now they're getting into the space of categorizing the incidents looking at affected industry and stakeholders um, and it's also going to be quite useful the product safety project that we're doing looking at potential health and mental health risks from AI and new technology um, we'll also be looking at including a product safety angle to the incident monitoring tool as well for AI. Um, so I realize that's been fairly quick, but um, they're the projects that we're doing at the moment um, and the work that our members are doing, um, looking at AI to assist regulators. Um, there's also the OECD AI Policy Observatory that I just wanted to share with everyone, um, which aims for policies, data and analysis for trustworthy artificial intelligence. The Policy Observatory uh, combines resources from across the OECD and its partners from a large range of stakeholder groups. Uh, it facilitates dialogue and provides multidisciplinary evidence-based policy analysis and data on AI's areas of impact. So the OECD AI Policy Observatory website is very large. It's a lot of really helpful information on there. We've got articles um, from stakeholders as well as reports from the OECD. So um, chances are, if you're working in the AI space, you will find useful information there. Um, I've also just included a link to the consumer policy page. And then we've also got the OECD AI principles to promote use of AI that's innovative, trustworthy, respects human rights and democratic values. Um, so there's a snippet of the information there, um, but we are setting up policies that we think will assist members for AI more generally, as well as in specific spaces like empowering consumers that we've been talking about today. So that's all from me. Um, thanks for the opportunity to have a chat with you all about our work. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, as a current enforcer, I, I totally share this idea that it's about efficiency, it's about enhancing us, but uh, yet at the first stage of the investigation where we are working more on detection of the violations, but later on definitely we need to uh, preserve all the, all the rights or to, to defend by the traders. So uh, it's helping us a lot, but, uh, but especially in the, in the first phase of, the, of our work. Uh, so now I would like to uh, turn to Angelo and uh, check what are the, uh, the newest tools in the possession of the European Co Commission with the eLab established in DigiJust. Angelo, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just trying to, I don't know whether you see my screen, but I'll try. Can you see it? Perfect. So. Good afternoon to, to, to all of you. Uh, thank you for I would like to thank you, Bob Piotr, you know, and uh, your Polish colleagues for, for moderating this panel and inviting us as European Commission to join. We are very honored, although we couldn't join physically, so I will have to do this remotely. I'm the deputy head of the uh, unit, uh, the group in the Commission, uh, which is responsible for enforcement of consumer legislation, and in this team, we do two main things. We coordinate enforcement activities of the member states in cases union-wide relevance. And we build capacity tools the national authorities can use to cooperate and investigate, including and especially, I would say, on digital markets. Now, um, I will in this presentation, I will get a little bit more into the specifics of those tools, although there's little time allowed. So I will try to go through them quite rapidly. And uh, as you can see from, from the slide, you know, I will, I will focus on three main strands of work that we are following. So the first two concern the use of AI powered AI power tools to investigate breaches of consumer legislation. And the first is our internet investigation laboratory. Then um, the second is behavioral experiments that we use to test, to test the impact of market practices on consumers. And then the third, as third last element, I will talk 
about a number of enforcement challenges relating to marketplaces which offer AI uh, and platforms which offer AI services. So if we look at the eLab, um, the, it's an internet investigation laboratory called the eLab, is an IT service powered by artificial intelligence that the Commission has put at the disposal and exclusive use of EU national authorities of the Consumer Protection Cooperation Network that we coordinate as Commission. So the need for such a tool, obviously, has been said by speakers here already, comes from the inability of enforcement agencies to face enforcement challenges on, on digital markets, particular, in particular monitoring with just human intervention. In a nutshell, too much to monitor with little resources and increased need to have rapid investigations which cover larger portion of market sectors. So this tool is a virtual environment which we launched in 2022 and which can be accessed remotely from anywhere in the EU, which literally means that investigators can use, their, can use this tool from their own IT facilities sitting in their offices in the member states. And it can be used for a number of investigation activities, especially to conduct large scales reviews of companies and practices. Uh, so there's a mix of web crawlers, you know, uh, AI powered tools, algorithms, you know, analytics that, that, that run, you know, to, to conduct those investigations so that they can analyze really vast amounts of data on, on, on the internet to identify indicators of specific infringements. And sorry, and the parameters can be set to be investigation specific so that, you know, AI powered algorithms can look for different type of elements and uh, different indicators of, of breaches. And I will, I will give uh, a quick example of that later. Uh, the um, eLabs offer various tools and functionalities and um, the, so we have, um, let me just turn the slide. So, um, so we have VPN, uh, so that investigators can use uh, hidden identity. We have specific software that allows to collect soft um, evidence as you go uh, while you're investigating and then transfer it to your own network, network, including time certification where that evidence was collected. Then um, the, the comprehensive analytic tools uh, to find out information about internet domains and companies. So these are open sources tools so they can search and combine different types of sources of information across different databases and geographical areas. And uh, they are very useful, for example, to find out who is behind a website or a web shop, but also to flag cybersecurity threats and uh, uh, risk scores or indicators of how um, the likelihood that the, the website is, is, is calm, you know, or is run by Froster. Now, if we look at two um, examples of how we use the, these tools and things now, the first one is Black Friday, we, is the price reduction tool which we used in the Black Friday uh, sweep we did last year, where we tested, <clears throat> basically we used the tool to verify whether discounts presented on, by online retailers on Black Friday were, were genuine. And uh, the result was that discounts were misleading for almost 2,000 products on 43% of the website that we followed. And to, to understand whether, of course, um, when discounts were genuine, we had to monitor 16,000 products at least for the month preceding Black Friday sales. Then um, another example is the, we call it FRED, the fake reviews detector. So this is something that um, we use. So the machine in this case scrapes and analyze text detecting to try to detect whether a review first is human or computer generated. And then beyond that, you know, when uh, even in case of human um, generated reviews, based on the type of language and terminology used uh, indicates as likelihood score or whether the review is genuine or is fake. It's been sponsored, for instance, you know. And the machine showed uh, 85 to 93 percent accuracy in this case. So um, this is just to give you two examples uh, of, 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 of this. Then the the other strand of activity that we are running at the moment is um, 
and we literally inaugurated this in the past months, is the use of behavioral experiments to test the impact of commercial practices on consumers. And this both to, um, we do this in the context of coordinated enforcement action of the CPC network that we coordinate against um, major business players uh, to, um, to test whether the commitments proposed by these companies to remedy specific problems are actually going to solve the problem. So, um, and we also test, we use these, 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 these behavioral studies to um, test uh, what is the, in general, more in general, what is the impact of specific commercial practices, which could co potentially constitute dark patterns uh, and this to prepare the grounds for investigations or other type of, of, of measures. So the, the first, um, I would say, strand of work in this area, we, we, we use, for example, to test the labeling of commercial talk content in the videos bro broadcasted by a, by a very well-known platform. So whether the indication, you know, and, and the sort of the qualification of commercial context is good enough, is prominent enough for consumers to understand it. And that's very important, I would say, in, in, in the type of um, I, um, platform tools that we, we, we are confronted every day on, 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 on the internet. Um, and the second one, so uh, we tested, for example, to, uh, to see what's the impact of cookies and choices related to targeted advertising. Okay, what is, what is interesting in these experiments is that um, they are calibrated based on the needs of each specific case, and we use large sample groups to produce credible, reliable scientific, or scientific results, so higher chance to, to identify significant statistical differences. Um, and we use also AI-powered tools to do this, including analytics, but also eye-tracking technology connected to analytics. And that we did, for example, to, to test the, the impact of advertising on, on children and minors, you know, and we tested them in lab. Now, um, the, last, the last thing I wanted, I wanted to, 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 to address here rapidly uh, it's an area which, which is drawing a lot of attention, which is mentioned also by previous speakers, at enforcement level, not only in the EU, but also in other jurisdictions, and is the offering of AI-based services to consumers, such as AI-powered language models, recently developed or union and recently becoming popular. And these models can generate, you know, uh, we all know these models, not by now, but they can generate human text human-like test responses to a given prompt. Such responses continue to improve based you know, on massive amount of text data from the internet, what is called reinforced layer learning from human feedback. And um, they are not offered only a standalone, but they'll be integrated in other services offered like platforms like search engines and, and marketplaces. While, while these practices have been investigated in the EU and other jurisdiction, I cannot say and I cannot say much about this ongoing investigation. Uh, the attention, I can, I can, however, flag a few elements where the attention of, of the stakeholders at the moment is focusing. So what are the issues? What are the problems? And, um, you know, we see that one, one main area of problem is the transparency of the business model. So um, what are really the characteristics? What is really offered? What is really the service? Uh, how it is, is this remunerated? How is this financed? This business model is financed. What are the differences in between the free version, so-called free version, um, and the paid for version? Uh, and how does this relate for, for the use of commercial, or use of data, uh, on personal data, also the consumers for, for commercial purposes, like for example, to, uh, to send targeted advertising. Now, um, so there's, there's this part, and then, you know, of course, you know, we are very focused at the moment on the risks, you know, of those models. So we have seen that often, you know, there is manipulative or misleading content, there are biases, errors, you know, and uh, one big concern is whether these platforms can you know, do an adequate mitigation of those risks. 
And then um, you have the problem of the harm of specific categories of, of consumers, which are weaker. Let's think about minors, but not only. And uh, associated to that, of course, is the mental health and, and, and possible addiction also, which has, been, which has been experienced already. So the difficulties here is that on the one hand, from a very, very general standpoint, we, we have um, a new, I would say, way you know, of applying consumer legislation and, and, and we need new um, uh, reference points you know, to apply consumer legislation to these, to these business models where you know the technological part is, is really still a, a little bit obscure you know so, so there's a technological and scientific gap in between enforcement and you know um, those those companies who run these platforms then the fact that these 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 elements are integrated in other business models often and then that we are at a crossroad here in between protection of the economic interest of consumers data protection so data privacy and the protection of health and safety. So uh, this adds quite a bit of complexity to the work of the enforcers who are nevertheless, you know, looking into the matter. Enforcement may not be enough. Uh, and as we know, there may be, may, may need to be sort of complemented by regulatory also intervention. And we will see about that. And that's all for me at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Uh, I have to admit that it's it's really fascinating idea that there will be this possibility to, to, to share uh, with the uh, European Commission the, the, the software they are um, preparing. So we have like this possibility to create our own department with a lot of people, very costly, um, to, to, to manage for, for each single uh, consumer protection agency. We can work also on projects like we did in in, in past, and uh, we are still engaged in that kind of of uh, developing of software. And but of course, the idea of just uh, addressing the the commission and and using the already prepared software is is great. Uh, so now now it's my turn to 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 give some insights about um, what we actually made in past and on what we are working right now. Uh, so I, I will I will uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about Arbus, the system which we made for the detection of unfair clause, unfair clauses, uh, but I will focus mm, on the, the main aspects, to not to not to prolong too much time. We need to speed up a little bit, and then I will share with you some ideas about the ongoing project on dark patterns and on preparing of white paper for the for the enforcers. So uh, going to, to, to back to 2020, when we actually figured out that we can use artificial intelligence for the enforcement actions, uh, it was not so obvious at that time. I mean, it is the time before ChatGPT, and uh, it was not so clear that uh, the natural language processing can really make such a amazing things. Uh, but we, we thought that we have to try with uh, th this possibility. We focus mostly on our efficiency and we uh, checked three factors for which uh, um, uh, direction we should go. So first of all, uh, we uh, consider the databases which were uh, in our possession. And then uh, we also um, uh, defined strictly our need. So what is actually uh, um, necessary for us to, to, to get more efficiency in which field? And finally, we also um, have in our view the perspective of the public interest and to, to, to uh, always have it in mind what is actually necessary for public opinion and to, 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 to speed up with, uh, with our work. And uh, as the result of that was the, this project on unfair, uh, unfair clauses, because we had a huge database for that, almost 10,000 entries uh, already established unfair clauses. So we could use them for uh, preparation of a proper database to, to fuel, to learn the, the machine, uh, how to detect it properly. 
Uh, secondly, the, it was our need because it's very time consuming. It's quite easy task for the employees, uh, but still it's, it's uh, hugely time consuming to read all the standard contract terms and to understand them and to um, indicate which provisions could be uh, treated as unfair. And finally, this is uh, really huge public interest because uh, uh, we have to take care of all the standard contracts and we try to eliminate as much as possible of unfairness uh, from that contract. And especially with uh, a fast growing uh, e-commerce market, it means that we have to um, uh, adjust our enforcement actions and work closely with the, with the sector. There's no other options uh, like uh, automatization of our actions for doing that. Uh, what about the challenges in the project? First of, first of all, database. So like I said, we had a huge uh, material for that, but still we had to use a lot of human work to structureize it. It's not so easy. You need to um, put it in the special uh, format. You need to choose one and then prepare that in a special way to make computer uh, to understand it. Uh, then uh, second problem which we faced at that time was the choosing of the vendor. So we were not able to hire like 50 uh, experts in data scientists. Uh, so we decided to work with uh, outsourcing and choosing um, um, a proper vendor was uh, very challenging for us. We used a special uh, type of uh, public tendering which was uh, preparing of POC first and then letting um, the information to the, to the market, uh, showing how it could be uh, solved, and at the same time asking, uh, asking the market for preparing the other POC, which we could compare on the very objective manner. And only because of the result of this contest, we decided on the, on the, uh, on the producer of the tool, and finally, and finally uh, the implementation of the software into our uh, organization. So again, it's, it's very challenging for the uh, traditional organizations, traditional institutions to um, empower them with the new tools and to help people who already established some kind of uh, work with the specific problem to make it differently, to make it in future uh, more efficiently, but still at some point people need to find the um, good reason for accepting the change. So taking uh, into consideration all the challenges, I have to say that we are already fully operating the system and we have the, uh, we have the first uh, good results, but still it's, it's the detection, so it's flagging. So definitely it's helping us in the first phase of the investigation, but later on after flagging of the provision, we have to do a proper investigation. That's, that's what we cannot change right now. Um, a, few, a few words about our current project, Dark Patterns. So this is the, again the um, uh, problem of detection of, uh, of violations which are quite widespread right now. There are some studies which showed that uh, a lot of e-commerce companies are involved in the Dark Patterns, which means uh, uh, generally that there are some kind of uh, deceive factors in their interfaces. And we try to prepare s the tool which will allow us to work much more faster. So not going from one website to another, not sh looking for the violations, but be much more proactive and uh, not just to wait on uh, the signals from the uh, harmed consumers, but to be able to proactively discover the, the, the violations. And here there are another problem because we have to create the database. We don't have um, already existed uh, database like in the first project. And so now we are working on the uh, ideas how we can do that, having in mind the possibility of verification of the construction of websites 
and uh, also uh, the, the database could be um, constituted on the outcomes of the neuromarketing researches which we are um, uh, going to, to, to uh, carry out. Uh, all of that shall allow us to build some specific group of factors which can allow uh, to um, figure out what is deceiving, what is not deceiving, and to fuel the machine for the proper, for the proper action uh, in that manner. Uh, and last but not least, we are also working on preparation of the white paper for the um, agencies uh, on the same uh, status as we, at, uh, which we have. Uh, it's um, uh, so it's our second project. So we already have some uh, problems, and we were able to to um, uh, solve that. And we have some ideas about the transparency and about the uh, way how we can how we can uh, safely introduce uh, deploy the software into the work on the enforcer. So we would like to share all that ideas with uh, the colleagues from other jurisdictions and we'd like to, to, to make it public next year. Um, so uh, going further, we also know that the Australian Competition and Consumer uh, Commission is working right now on different projects and Sally, if you hear us, could you uh, share with us the more insights about what is going on right now in ACCC? I'm not used to using Zoom, I'm afraid. So um, is someone able to uh, maybe talk me through how to share my screen? Sorry. I think that there is the share button. And the at the bottom. At the bottom. In the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, I will uh I will present like this. I'm sorry, hopefully that is readable to everyone. Great. Okay, look, thank you so much for having me uh, attend today. Thanks to IGF for hosting this meeting and also to your kick for arranging the panel today. I'm sorry I can't be in Kyoto, but I'm pleased to attend virtually. Um, so my name is Sally, I'm Exec Director of Data Strategy at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Um, and today I'm going to be addressing the theme of AI as the source of empowerment from three different angles. First, using AI to detect consumer protection issues. Second, understanding AI in consumer protection cases. And third, perhaps a little more tenuously, enabling the development of consumer-centric AI. So first, using AI to detect consumer protection issues. At the ACCC, like at many other regulators, we have several projects on foot that are looking at methods of proactive detection. And these broadly fall into two categories. The first category is streamlined web form processing. So every year we receive hundreds of thousands of complaints from consumers about issues they've encountered when buying products and services. Many of these complaints are submitted through the ACCC's website in a form that has a very large field in which users type out the narrative of what has occurred. 
the issue with this approach is that our analysis of the form can be quite manual. So we've been experimenting with using AI to streamline this processing. The techniques uh, that we've been experimenting with include entity extraction, so using natural language processing to identify parts of speech which likely refer to particular products like phone or car or kettle, hot water bottle, for instance, uh, and also companies as well we use entity extraction for. Uh, another technique that we've experimented with is classification, that is using supervised learning to classify complaints according to the industry that they relate to, um, agriculture, energy, health, etc., or the type of issue that they relate to. So that's the type of um, consumer protection issue. And then we've also been more recently experimenting with predictive analysis to determine how relevant a complaint is likely to be to one of the agency's enforcement and compliance priorities. I have listed on the slide some examples of our priorities from this year, which include uh, environmental and sustainability claims um, that might be inaccurate, also consumer issues in global domestic supply chains and product safety issues uh, impacting infants and young children. Now the outputs of these models are not yet at a level of reliability that we would be comfortable with before deploying them into production, uh, but it is something that we are actively working on and shows a lot of promise. The second category is not about analysing data that we already have, it's about collecting and analysing new sources of information. Um, and we've heard uh, a lot of examples of this today. Um, so scraping retail sites to identify so-called duck patterns. Um, as others have pointed out, uh, duck patterns or manipulative design practices are design choices that lead consumers to making purchasing decisions they might not otherwise have done. And sometimes these choices are so manipulative that we consider them to be misleading in the breach of the consumer law. And examples include was now pricing and scarcity claims that are, are untrue. And we've also looked at subscription traps and to a lesser extent, uh, they could use as well. The techniques that we use in this space are quite simple, actually. So if a claim like only one left in stock is hard coded into the HTML uh, behind the page, we know we have a problem. Uh, so a lot of this analysis is actually based on regular expressions. So basically looking for strings of text uh, but we do have an AI component that we use to navigate retail sites as part of the scrapes uh, and to identify which pages are likely to be product pages. Uh, turning to the second lens at looking to this, at this question of uh, empowering consumers with AI, I thought it might be useful to touch on some of our cases where we have obtained and analysed algorithms that were used by suppliers in their interactions with consumers. And this is a really important thing to be able to do from an enforcement perspective. As algorithms are increasingly, and here I'm slipping into using algorithms instead of AI, as, as Christine mentioned, AI is uh, a bit of a misnomer. But as algorithms are increasingly used to implement decisions across the economy, regulators must be able to understand and explain what they're doing. Um, so we've had a few cases and market inquiries where we've needed to do this and I thought I'd explain a little bit more about what our approach is and I'm going to speed up as well given the time. So when we need to understand how an algorithm operates, we'll typically look at three types of information that we obtain using our statutory information gathering powers. So the first type of information is source code. Um, that is the code that describes the rules that process the input into the output. Um, and we've had a few cases where we have obtained source code from firms and worked through it line by line to determine how it operates. It's a very labour intensive process, but it's proven valuable, if not critical, for a few of our cases. The second type of information we obtain sometimes in algorithm cases is input output data, which is useful because it tells us how the algorithm operated in practice in relation to actual consumers. It helps us establish not just whether conduct occurred, but also what the harm was. So how many consumers were affected and to what extent. 
And then finally, the third type of information we obtain is business documentation, so emails and reports, etc. And this is useful because it tells us what the firm was trying to achieve. Often when firms tweak their algorithms, they'll run experiments on consumers, on their, on their customer base, um, so-called A-B testing. And so obtaining documentation about those experiments can shed light on what was intended to be achieved. Uh, the last point I'll make on this slide, uh, and mentioned earlier, a, a few of many other regulators are doing this as well, is we use predictive coding for document review. So we use machine learning to help expedite the review of documentation that we obtain from firms in our investigations. Okay, and very lastly, I thought I would briefly touch on a topic that's a little more future focused, um, which is the possible emergence of consumer centric AI. So this is more about empowering consumers in the marketplace as opposed to empowering consumer protection regulators. Um, the ACCC has a role in implementing the consumer data right, which is an economy-wide reform in Australia that gives consumers more control over their data. It enables them to access and share their data with accredited third parties to identify offers that might suit their needs. Um, currently, the Australian government is consulting um, publicly on draft legislation to expand the functionality of the consumer data right to include what's called action in initiation. So that will enable accredited parties to handle not just data, but also actions on behalf of consumers with their consent. Um, so even though this is very early days, um, perhaps uh, in the future, as a result of initiatives like action initiation in the data right, um, we might see the emergence of more consumer-centric AI. So AI that helps consumers navigate information asymmetries and to bypass manipulative design practices to access products and services that are most suited to their needs. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. So it looks like a lot is happening actually in this in this sphere. Uh, but still, uh, there, there is the report made by Tony Blair Institution, Institute, uh, which indicates that there should be some reorganization and some new opening for the technological change, uh, especially in the uh, UK. So, Kevin, if you could give us some recommendations about the, the report. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Prada. Thank you, everyone, for sort of sticking in uh, at this hour, especially here. So our work in, in this space is fundamentally, uh, it's, it's joining two, two parts. Like the first one is our work on AI for proactive public services. So we do believe that AI has an enormous potential to transform the way we deliver public services. And the big picture is, of course, concerns uh, areas such as personalized healthcare, personalized education. So in many ways, create a new paradigm that is tech-enabled, but also uh, institutional to provide a new way um, to think and then actually uh, offer public services. Um, so that's the first component. And the second component is the work that uh, in, our, in our unit uh, we've carried out in, in, in consumer protection. We did commission uh, a, a last year uh, an important report to uh, a consumer um, protection expert, this call, uh, that Christine no knows very well. Um, where we actually looked at um, potentially um, at consumer protection uh, regulation as a framework for internet regulation. So um, these are, are the two main components um, for, uh, for, for this panel that I've, I've tried to, to join. So in terms of, I, I thought that it would have been, it would have been useful to like offer uh, uh, an overview about the baseline scenario as someone, you know, considering I'm someone, I'm, I'm not a regulator, uh, so um, it, it's useful to assess like the way, you know, the way we're at now. And it seems clear that the, the main challenges for like most regulators around the globe are the fact that the re their resources are very limited and outdated rules contribute to a law enforcement culture and therefore a legitimization of uh, illegitimate practices, the fact that there is an even international capacity which has, has been reiterated by many pa other panelists, and low, very low cross-border uh, enforcement coordination, and finally the fact that action is reactive and slow rather than proactive as firms uh, entrench power. And on the sort of disruptive incumb incumbent side, uh, I think the most important one is the fact that 
um, you know, incumbents can become so dominant that they offer a very selective interpretation of consumer, of consumer rights. For example, prioritizing um, like consumer, uh, pr yeah, like customer service excellence, for instance, over like other forms of uh, of, sa of safeguards. Uh, Martina, if you could move to the next slide. Okay, I can continue. Uh, so, what um, what we what the what we've looked at at the institutes then like the very important uh, review um, that um, the the stand the Stanford Center for Digital Informatics has carried out. Uh, it's a very comprehensive survey. Almost in terms of coverage, is almost a, uh, it reaches the level of coverage that the OECD would have uh, in this very comprehensive global surveys and. The, this comprehensive like review like deals with the adoption of computational antitrust by agencies throughout the globe, and uh, 26 countries responded to this survey. And um, out of this survey, I selected two examples that I think are quite telling about how consumer protection authorities are embracing AI. Um, the first one is Finland. So Finland has carried out, uh, the Finnish uh, co Consumer and Competition Authority, I think, has carried out quite an interesting exercise using AI. Basically using AI as part of their cartel screening process. Um, and they're, instead of, instead of sort of looking at their past data uh, to build tools uh, for the future, they actually started with a sort of ex post and reflexive uh, testing of, of AI. So they looked at previous cases uh, and sort of simulated a what-if scenario. So they looked at previous cases, uh, in particular w uh, some that dealt with two substantial Nordic cartels which operated in the asphalt paving market uh, in, in Finland and Sweden. And they essentially compared uh, the, you know, the baseline scenario, which was the real one that happened, where they did not have AI, uh, and they compare that with um, they benchmark it against um, the um, a, a scenario where they actually could have used AI and assess the two different performances. And they did uh, it, it. It did appear uh, quite clearly that utilizing a mix of supervised machine learning and, and separate distributional regression test, they could have found out about. Thank you, thank you, Martina. They could have found out uh, about uh, those cartels uh, in a much quicker way, and therefore this this enables this this has enabled them to basically build new ex officio uh, cartel investigation tools. So this could constitute a very important deterrent for uh, for for example uh, companies that create cartels because you have uh, effectively a competition authority that has. Yeah, quite a quite an effective tool, uh, quite an effective um, extra feature tool to to detect these patterns. And then the other one is that is probably a little bit less sophisticated, but um, again, Christine would know uh, like uh, would know about this very well. Actually, in the UK, there is no requirement for parties to a merger to notify the Competition Markets Authority, which is the relevant authority in the UK of a transaction. So uh, it used to be that the CMA had to sort of very manually monitor new sources to identify these mergers, so uh, a, a tremendous uh, waste of time, um, and especially for a regulator that is already like very uh, stretched in terms of resources, both financially and in terms of time. So the unit has developed recently a tool that tr actually track tracks mergers activities in a in an automatic way using using ML you know so a, a series a series of techniques that are very are very similar to the ones that uh, the other panelists have, have described so I'm not going to go too much into detail but it just it just a textbook example of what uh, you know in many ways the lower hanging fruit of of, of AI um, as used um, by consumer protection authorities, particularly in in in, in, in legislation such as the UK, where uh, the notifier requirements may m are less are less sort of um, onerous than maybe in other uh, legislation such as, uh, for example, in the in the EU. And then I thought that I uh, would have been nice to conclude, um, Martina. Again, if you could move to the 
Next slide would be grateful. Um, with a series of policy questions um, that Angela, Angela has sort of touched upon um, pre uh, pre um, previously. Um, and these questions are about, I think, uh, the ethics of the algorithm. And in particular, um, if you think about the Finnish model, the fact that AI is very good at detecting patterns, but we know from, for example, the application of AI in healthcare that it's not necessarily as good at detecting causality. So it can be quite dangerous to uh, to start from a from an AI um, detected pattern and and draw like quite uh, and and draw like conclusions without uh, without human oversight. In the case of the Finnish, in the, in the case of the Finnish authority, uh, they were very much aware of it, and in fact, they in as part of their um, as part of their assessment, they have a second stage where, if let's say, the AI tool, the, the sort of supervised learning, tells them that uh, there is like that there are, for example, three companies operating as a cartel, they would then have a, a, a human oversight stage where they would basically have to find, to try to find any other possible explanation uh, alternative to that. And this is uh, very closely related in, in the EU to Article 14 of, of the AI Act, which is one of the most important article and uh, deals precisely with, with human oversight. So. For most regulators, uh, I imagine one of the most important challenges it's going to be to essentially draw this line, like where does the um, the, the automation, where does the AI empowered um, um, sort of step begins and ends, and when does the human human oversight uh, begin, and in, in what in what uh, in what modes? And finally, uh, uh, one of one of <laughs> like the last question is like the role that large language models can actually play. I did find I did find it uh, interesting that in the in the survey uh, in the, in the survey uh, published by Stanford, out of twenty six competition authorities, only one, the the Greek one, um, explicitly mentioned uh, a, um, a, an LLM uh, powered tool that that they're using. Now I imagine that this is not the case. I'm sure, like plenty of other consumer authorities, have been using LLMs throughout the last year, but we're probably reluctant to say so, uh, for obvious reasons. But it's um, it seems likely at the same time that uh, regulators, by default, are you know risk adverse, and these large language models do pose like quite quite important risks. Uh, uh, particularly in terms of in terms of privacy, um, for example. Uh, um, one of one of the competition uh, authorities, it was trialing uh, um, an AI-powered bot for to deal with whistleblowing. Uh, so, the, so a case where you know when you're building a tool like that, uh, the, the privacy concerns are clearly very important. So, it, the thing, the last question is, uh, does the generative capacity of these models have actually anything significant to offer to consumer regulation or other forms? Uh, of AI, probably more like low hanging fruit are instead more suited uh, for um, a regulatory uh, environment. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I, I just need to mention that definitely we are working on the setting the line properly between the, the, the place where AI is working and the way where we are making the oversight. Very shortly, we are closing to the to the end of the session. But very shortly, I would like to ask each of the of the panelists uh, the question about the future. Uh, one minute per per each. Christine, can you start with you? Uh, great, absolutely. So one minute. So I'll use um, three key words. Then um, I think the future is a lot of homework on classification and normative work. Are we all talking about the same thing? What really is AI? What are the different strands? And trying to get the consumer lawyers and the users to actually understand what the technologists are really talking about. Collaboration is the next. I think uh, there's real um, urgency in, and, and I'm really welcome what we heard today about ISPEN really trying to gather and galvanize the consumer agencies because project in common probably will be a better use of money and then and able to yield better result. And um, my um, last key word would be to be um, reactive and completely transform the way consumer law is enforced. If we can move from the stage we're at where we use AI to simply detect, 
to a place where actually we can prevent the harm being done to consumer, then that would obviously be a fantastic advancement for the protection of consumers around the world. Thank you, uh, Melanie. Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, look, I think as businesses are always going to move quickly, where there's a chance for money to be made, um, they'll do it. And they're unrestricted in many ways compared to regulators who are often too slow to address the problem. Um, so I think collaboration is the key and sharing our learnings so that we can all move quickly to address the issue and have a, a good future focus on it, you know, really recognising that we can't make regulations at anywhere near the pace that technology is advancing. Um, and I think honesty in the collaboration is key. So we need to not be afraid to share things that we tried that didn't work and explain why they didn't work so that other people can learn from our mistakes as well as our successes. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Angelo, do you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. For, for us, it's basically our priority for the next year will be to try to improve and increase the use of uh, AI investigations. So uh, we will we would like to to do to do first of all more activities to monitor compliance like sweeps. We would like to develop the technology to to make this tool able also to sweep and monitor images, videos, sounds. Um, so basically to really to really be fit, you know, for, for, for what they need to monitor on the digital reality. And then to cover different type of infringement indicators. You know, one of our focus focuses will be scams and counterfeiting. But on the misleading advertising side, for example, uh, well it's been mentioned we would like to to use it for for for, for a number of 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 of, um, of breaches, like for example, the lack of disclosure of material connection in between influencers and traders, and then what we would like to do also is to improve, um, and that's what you also mentioned, Piotr, earlier the the case handling side. So um, to try to for this tool to make it even easier also for investigators then to use the evidence at a national level, as we know that evidence, uh, that the rules concerning the gathering of evidence are very national, you know, jurisdiction specific, you know, and they may be different in a screenshot, maybe, maybe sort of enough in a country, but not in another. So we would like to, the tool also to help and already gather, you know, and as much as possible, the evidence in the format, which is required for on behavioral experiments, we we are also planning to do uh, seven more studies until the end of next year, uh, and uh, one basically every ten weeks, um, and continue. Yeah, on this track. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, Sally. Yes, thanks. So, uh, priority for us in the near future is actually. Uh, Going back to basics and thinking about our sources of data that we have available, um, we've been giving thought to trying to make better use of data that's collected by other government departments, as well as data that we could potentially obtain from data brokers, from other third parties, um, hospitals even, for instance, and also data that we can co collect from consumer them consumers themselves, for example, making better use of social media data to detect issues. Thank you, Sally. And last word from Kevin. So, so I think for me, uh, essentially, what I've what I've said what I said before, like I would recommend to regulators to actually have a sort of retrospective uh, dialectic with AI. So, to to sort of answer, like to address the questions about human oversight, uh, where does the automation start and end? Where does the human oversight start? Uh, to basically look at past cases that they know very well and to utilize tools such as you know the ones that I've described in the, in the Finnish authority has used to basically test the potential but also the limitation of these models and I think the best way to do it is this very sort of, sort of continuous process of, of again of engaging with content with cases that you already know very well 
and you know you, you perhaps may find that the AI detected patterns that you not they did not notice, detected things they did not notice, or or perhaps you also may found that uh, some patterns that the AI detected actually didn't are not were not necessarily particularly consequential for um, uh, for for like uh, the enforcement outcome. So, I think. Uh, I know the regulators are always, uh, again, like uh, understaffed and uh, have to deal with limited resources, but I think dedicate some time to these types of sort of retrospective uh, exercise to develop uh, ex officio tools can be extremely useful, especially in, in realities like the EU where we will have to deal with a very, with a very significant piece of legislation on AI uh, whose you know, certain details, particularly around human oversights, are not necessarily fully clear. So inevitably, uh, this, pro this like dialectic pr process will have to will have to happen to understand like what is the right model to operate. Yes, thank you very much. And yeah, definitely, I, I, I made my notes, and we we will have a lot of work uh, to do in the near future. A lot of things to to f uh, to, to classify, uh, a lot of meetings, collaboration, and definitely the outcome will be pro proactive. I strongly believe in the in the work which we are doing. Uh, now I, I would like to close the panel, thank all the panelists for the great discussion, and of course thank the organizers for enabling us to to have this discussion and to to be a little bit late with the last session. Thank you very much.